Hello, everybody. I'm John Stern, the Director Emeritus of the Irvine Museum, and I'm delighted to have been asked to participate in Realism Live. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I hope all of you out there enjoy the lecture. So my lecture today is on the historical development of realism. I'm going to talk and show images of how realism came and how it became an important part of today's art. Realism in art is defined as a style of art that portrays ordinary people and events in commonplace settings and engage in real pursuits. This is important because we're going to see later that there is also a very important style of realism that, that deals with other aspects like mythology and history. Realism is an approach to art that requires detailed observation and the goal is to portray the real, not the ideal. This is a Roman mosaic dating from about 50 BC and it shows uh, a market scene. There is no message here, there is no mythology, there is no encouragement to do anything. It is purely a realistic scene of a market with fish and a chicken and some vegetables. Um, there's a lot of this type of art in Roman uh, history. There's mo a lot of wall paintings that have not come down to us because they've uh, been destroyed. But what we do have, like this piece, is a floor mosaic. So the floor mosaic survive a lot better than, than the wall paintings. Here's another Roman floor mosaic. It is a fishing scene. Again, it's just ordinary people. Uh, doing everyday things that they do for a living. In this case, there are a couple of fishermen that are catching fish. Uh, this is from a floor from a Roman mansion in Libya, in Leptis Magna, and it was done sometime in a 200 to 250 AD. With the fall of the Roman Empire, um, the Western world, Western Europe, uh, became very religious. Uh, Christianity uh, became the most important thing in daily life and uh, the role of the artist uh, for the next 800 years was to portray the Bible, to portray stories of the Bible and to do in an easy and uh, easy to understand way. It was the way that you taught the Bible to a large a number of people that did not read. So this is a a painting from one of the Gospels from uh, Byzantine era, dates about 575 AD, and it shows the ascension of Christ. When you look at these and compare them to the fishing scene we just saw and to the market scene, you could see how it is completely different. Uh, this is not a painting of reality, it's a painting of an ideal, of a belief. This is a work by the early Renaissance, late medieval painter Duccio, and it shows a Madonna and child. This is done at a time when there was not a lot of um, study in terms of, of improving the art. So you see that there's no background. Uh, it is a very direct statement of the Virgin with baby Jesus. And notice that baby Jesus looks like a full grown man, but reduced in size. This is the interior of a typical Catholic church during the Middle Ages. This happens to be the church of St. Francis of Assisi. And notice that it is completely covered. Every part of the wall is covered with a painting or a, a detail. And each of those big paintings that you see right down the center of the aisle are various stories from the Bible. They're painted in such a way that people will look at them and immediately get the message. Here is one of those panels. It's a mural uh, painted by Giotto, a great early Renaissance painter, and it illustrates the kiss of Judas. This is when Judas was betrayed, betraying Christ, and Christ was arrested in the garden. During the Renaissance, uh, a lot of these religious paintings were done, and they are painted in a much more mature style. The forms are very realistic, the colors are bright, there's three-dimensional space. Uh, this particular view is the adoration of the shepherds, 
and it was painted by Annibale Caracci, uh, one of the great Italian painters. It was done in 1598. So the forms are very realistic, um, but the lighting, the staging, and the subject are still concerned with religion. Here's another religious painting. This was done in Spain by an artist named Juan Sanchez Cotan. It is the Holy Family, and again, uh, the forms are very well done. They're very well represented as human beings. There's a couple of angels. But this is typical of high Renaissance Spanish religious painting. The artist, uh, Juan Sanchez Cotan, very interesting artist because he also painted these remarkably modern looking still lifes. There is no religious content here. These are closely observed still life of a melon, a cabbage, and an apple, uh, done with beautiful lighting and with exact representation. This is a type of painting that was not real mainstream Renaissance painting, but it did exist and it was the beginning of realism in Europe. This is a late medieval painting of the calling of Saint Matthew. If you recall the biblical story, uh, Jesus and his apostles uh, come to find Matthew, who is a taxpayer, and they convince him uh, to join them. Here is the same subject but handled quite differently. This is a high Renaissance painting by the artist Caravaggio, and it shows what looks like an ordinary setting, perhaps a room, perhaps an inn, and there's a group of people, and at the far left is Matthew counting his coins, and Jesus comes in from the right and points to Matthew, and everybody else says, oh, he's, he's the guy you want, and this is the high Renaissance version of what we saw as the calling of St. Matthew. One of the great Spanish painters of the Renaissance was Francisco de Surberan, and as you can see, he was a student of Caravaggio. Uh, he loved to have that raking light. This is an effect that's called chiaroscuro. Uh, chiaro means light and oscuro means dark. So it's basically the light uh, coming off from a dark background. It is a very a moving, very emotional way to paint. So this is St. Francis in Meditation, a, a religious painting, but done uh, with this chiaroscuro effect. Another painting by Zurbaran is completely different. Uh, this is a still life, and it is not religious. Uh, there is no message here. It's a still life that shows lemon, oranges, and a rose. And it is done with that chiaroscuro effect, a light, strong light coming from one side and um, bringing the objects forward to the viewer against a dark background. Now we come to the great period of realism in Europe. This is in Holland during the 17th century. Uh, it's an interesting effect that all of a sudden in northern Holland, a group of artists would start painting something that's completely different than what we saw in terms of religious um, iconography. This is uh, painters that decided to do ordinary life and ordinary people. Part of this is due to the Dutch War of Independence. It was a Spanish colony for a long time, and the northern part of Holland uh, became the Dutch Republic uh, in 1581. It also became active in the Protestant Reformation, um, Martin Luther's movement, where a lot of the uh, beliefs, iconography, and approaches to religion uh, were changed and were made more simple and more current to people's lives. Uh, moreover, the Dutch uh, were extremely good commercial people. They had uh, ships, uh, mostly from the East India Dutch Company. Uh, the East India Dutch Company was a monopoly on spices. So these Dutch ships would go all the way down to Southeast Asia uh, on India and collect spices and all sorts of other rare goods and bring them back to Europe and they would trade them and make a lot of money from this commerce. This is a painting by Hendrik Verum and it shows a group of ships in a harbor. They are in fact ships from the East India trading company, and it was painted about 1620, 
And this is a kind of painting that a rich merchant, one who has a high stake in the East India um, trading company and would want it in his home uh, to show his wealth, to have people come to his home, uh, see where his wealth comes from. It comes from these ships that go trading all over the world and the goods are returned to Holland and sold all over Europe. Here's another painting that you would find in a rich merchant's home. It's by Floris van Dyck and it's a still life with all sorts of abundance. This is the table of a rich person and they want to show that in their home. These are not paintings you hang in a church. These are not paintings you hang in a tavern. These are paintings you, you hang in your home and they're done in a very tight, very accurate, realistic manner. As early as the 1550s, the Dutch began selling tulip bulbs and this led to the uh, almost 100 years of the tulip mania where uh, people all over Europe were collecting uh, tulip bulbs and the more rare, the more elegant the flower, the higher the cost. Among the most uh, rare, uh, as you see in this painting by Ambrosius Boskert, and the ones with all the stripes are the rarest ones and they were named like Semper Augustus or Viceroy. And this is typical of somebody that made a ton of money uh, trading in tulips bulb. They would have this in their home and they would show their friends and the visitors that, that this is the source of their wealth. Moreover, the Dutch 17th century painters were very acute observers. If you look carefully, there's the three arrows that point uh, to a dragonfly at the top. In the middle is a caterpillar and on the tabletop is a butterfly. So this is also typical of this Dutch uh, realism. It's, it's painting not only the flowers, but also uh, little things like um, ladybugs, flies, whatever would be on the flowers. This is a painting by Adrian Brouwer and it's typical of a large class of paintings. They'd be small paintings and they mostly tavern scenes and they show people playing cards or drinking or having a good time in a tavern. These again were meant to be displayed in somebody's home. They, these are not paintings that have to do with trading. Uh, they don't have anything to do with religion. They have to do with everyday life. This is by David Teniers the Younger um, who comes to symbolize a style called the Little Dutch Masters. Little as opposed to the big Dutch masters like Vermeer and Rembrandt, which we'll see later. But Teniers also focused on everyday life of the tavern. And they're done in a very realistic manner. They have a beautiful three-dimensional space and they show ordinary life. Uh, this is what we call genre, G-E-N-R-E. -E. It's an approach to painting where you show everyday people doing everyday uh, activities. This is a church interior by Peter Sanredam and it was painted in 1649. You remember the church of St. Francis of Assisi that was a Catholic church covered with decoration? Well, as a result of the Reformation, um, the Northern European churches tended to be very plain. And here you see there's really not much on the walls and it's a church and it's meant for, for religious purposes, for praying, um, but it, it doesn't have the type of paintings that you would associate with a Catholic church. One of the great Dutch masters is Peter de Hoek. Uh, this is a beautiful painting of ordinary people in their yard. This is a Dutch courtyard. Uh, you see people relaxing. The young lady there that's talking to the two men is drinking a tall glass of beer. And there's a child looking on. It's painted with very exacting detail. There's a beautiful sense of space, um, very realist in its approach. The most famous of the Dutch masters of realism uh, was Johan Vermeer. And this is one of his great paintings. It's called The View of Delft. It was painted in 1659. Again, realism, uh, buildings, ships, water. Um, there's no message here. Uh, there's no encouragement to do anything. It's just uh, capturing an ordinary view, but done in a super tight, super detailed, carefully observed, uh, realist manner. 
Another by Vermeer. This is a small painting. It's, it's only 21 and a half inches by 17. And it's called The Little Street. But if you look closely, just about every brick in those walls is rendered. And it's rendered as accurately as possible. There's some people in the painting where they're not at all paying attention to you, you the viewer. They're not paying attention to Vermeer as he's painting them. They're just doing what they do normally. And um, this is one of the highlights of realism. It's, it's painting everyday ordinary scenes, but doing it in, in a very fine and very detailed manner. Another Vermeer. This is the interior of one of those rich merchant's homes. Uh, look at the floor. It's marble. Uh, look at the walls. They're thick and beautiful leaded glass windows. On a table is a Persian carpet, which was a real rare thing to have in those days. And in the background, there's a young woman who's getting piano lessons from the master. You see on the wall, there's a mirror directly above the young lady. And then to the right is a painting. A very good representation of the interior of a rich merchant's house. In England, there's an interesting artist uh, who had a group of followers. The artist is Joseph Wright of Derby. I know it looks like Derby, but it's pronounced Derby. He loved to paint interior scenes at night where there's a bright source of light. Especially, he painted uh, forges and blacksmith shop where the iron that the master is working on is glowing yellow hot and is lighting up the room. So you see there's a really detailed interior. Um, there's also the mechanism of the forge, uh, but also there's all sorts of people there. There's uh, mothers, children, and, and they're looking on as, as these workers are creating uh, the iron that, that they're working on. I'd like to talk now about the French academic style, also called the Salon style. It is characterized by perhaps the best superb realist approach to art uh, in Europe at the time and I think since then. Uh, some of the artists are, are absolutely masters of painting with very, very fine detail and very beautiful forms and beautiful colors. Uh, the Salon was the exhibition arm of the French Academy and there was a jury uh, that decided which artists will be shown and which would not be shown. Uh, they had a certain uh, requirement of subject matter. Uh, it had to be done in a very, very high realist style, but the subject was important to them. And they loved paintings of history, uh, paintings of mythology, uh, paintings of allegory and paintings that have a moral message. They were not interested in displaying contemporary realists, uh, that is to say the ordinary life of poor people, ordinary people, and they certainly didn't like Impressionism. It, it was uh, too modern for them and, and a lot of the young artists that, that um, were Impressionists, uh, and they kept being rejected and, and later on they formed their own exhibition which started Impressionism. Here's one of those gorgeous realist painters. It has to do with history. It's by Ernest Messonnier, who is a great painter of military subjects in Spain. It's called the French Campaign of 1814, but it was painted in 1864, so this is history. And it's not a big painting. It's only about 20 by 30 inches, but it is uh, beautifully detailed. The first four or five figures behind Napoleon, it's, it's it's almost like there's a portrait of each individual general. And you see there's this beautiful space, uh, there's depth, but there's a lot of detail and it tells a story. It tells an historical story. The subject of this painting is morality and it's called The Adulterers. It's by Jules Garnier, one of the great French realist painters. This is a large painting. It was done in 1876 and it shows um, how the village is reacting to discovering a man and a woman who are in adultery. Uh, it's somewhat stylized, but uh, the detail is stupendous. It is just wonderful detail. Um, in, in Salon paintings, in French academic paintings, you will see a, a lot of the nude figures, mostly women, but also men. And the nude figure 
was okay if, was, if it was presented in one of these approved themes. So in this case, there's a moral to this painting and uh, the fact that the woman is nude and the man is nude just adds to the story that, that tells you that you shouldn't be doing adultery. Perhaps the most famous of the French academic paintings. This is by William Bouguereau, um, perhaps the greatest artist who ever lived. Uh, it is The Birth of Venus, painted in 1879. This is a very large painting. Venus is actually a little bit more than life-size, but it is a gorgeous nude woman. Uh, there's a lot of other nude women, and it is telling a story. It is telling the story of the birth of Venus, and that is the message. The fact that there's some beautiful nude women is okay because it is clothed in this mythological message. This is an allegory by Edouard Bisson, another of the great Salon painters. An allegory uh, uses images to portray a message, to send something uh, to the viewer. In this case, it's spring. Uh, the woman is covered with flowers. There's a couple of little angels there that are bringing flowers to her. This is a magnificent painting by Rosa Bonheur, the great French 19th century painter. Uh, she loved to paint farm scenes. She loved to paint animals, horses, cattle, dogs. This is a big painting. It's a hundred inches across and it shows uh, two teams of oxen uh, plowing in, in the Nivernais, which is a region of France. It was painted in 1849. A big, beautiful painting, exacting detail, perfect lighting. This is very much uh, typical of the great paintings that you'll see in the French academic style. Here's another allegory. Uh, this is an allegory of chastity. It's by William Bouguereau. Uh, again, the painting is just perfectly presented. A beautiful woman, uh, wearing beautiful clothes. Uh, she has this antique vessel next to her, this Greek vessel, and she's in a bright, happy sunshine day. And behind her is a, an angel, a Cupid, whispering uh, about springtime and about love, uh, but she's ignoring it. She's going to uh, stay uh, and wait until she gets married before she has sex. Uh, Bouguereau painted um, the other side of the token. This is an allegory of promiscuity. And you see the woman is not dressed in white. Uh, she's not a bright, happy setting. Uh, there's no angel whispering in her ear. And the vessel that she brought with her to the well is broken. So um, this is the allegory of promiscuity. Another allegory uh, by Jules Lefebvre, one of the great um, French painters and teacher to a lot of American painters in Paris. This is the truth. It's the naked truth. And you can see it's a beautiful naked woman, but that wasn't shocking because she represents one of these ideals. She represents truth. Here's another beautiful naked woman. This one is by Edouard Manet, called Olympia. But this painting was shocking. This drew a lot of criticism. Uh, people were very upset at this painting. Well, it's a beautiful naked woman, but she's not representing any of those ideals. Uh, this is in fact a woman that's presented as a prostitute. Uh, the, she's greeting the next client, which is the viewer. Uh, the client has brought these flowers that the maid is holding up. And the prostitute, Olympia, Olympia was a common nickname for prostitutes in those days. Uh, she is greeting the visitor. So this was shocking, simply because it was nude, but it didn't fit one of those categories, those ideal categories. This is the painter Gustave Courbet, who is credited with the big renaissance of contemporary realism in France. And his famous quote, he was interviewed and uh, they said, Monsieur Courbet, why don't you paint angels like Monsieur Bouguereau? And he said, I have never seen an angel. Show me one and I will paint it. So he was very much into contemporary realism. This is not realism that has to do with any of those ideals like history and morals and mythology. It is realism that is just happening as you look around. 
especially in a small French town, not in the center of Paris, but towns that are concerned with farming. His famous painting, and it's a very large painting, it's called A Burial at Onan. It was painted in 1849. Uh, there's like 28 portraits here of people that are attending a funeral. Um, they're ordinary people, there's the priest, there's the attendants, but most of the people are just villagers, they're dressed in ordinary clothing, and they're there to say goodbye to one of their own. There's no message, there's no idealism here, it is just contemporary realism. Another painting by Courbet, this is what happens after the harvest. Uh, some people have to get these baskets and sift the grain out so it can be later made into flour. Again, contemporary realism, just ordinary people, in this case, uh, part of the farming routine. This is a painting by Honoré Daumier, uh, one of the great French realists, but an early, um, an urban realist. Uh, this was painted in 1864, and it is really a document of the poor people, the people that are not able to afford uh, all the wealthy things that we saw earlier in the salon. This is a group of people taking the third class uh, carriage on the train. They can't afford to go second class, uh, let alone first class. So you see ordinary people um, doing absolutely nothing that's of any interest to anybody, but it is a portrayal of contemporary uh, realism, urban realism. This is a beautiful landscape by Claude Monet. Yes, this is Claude Monet, the Impressionist, but he was only 18 years old when he painted this. This is a very realist landscape with beautiful handling of light, of colors, of detail. Uh, this is the type of thing that a lot of young artists were painting. They were painting outdoors, they were painting what was in front of them. And most of this type of painting was rejected by the Salon jury. And eventually, these young artists got together decided they'd paint what they want to paint and they'd have their own exhibition, which was in 1874. And that group of artists came to be known as the Impressionists. Here is a later Monet that's fully Impressionist. Uh, it's a bend in the river uh, and it's full of quick brush strokes, uh, lots of bright colors, uh, creates a lot of light. There's not much detail. There certainly is no message here. Uh, there's no history, there's no mythology. It is a beautiful, light-filled, impressionist view of, of the landscape and, and the bright, brilliant leaves and against the blue sky. This is a painting that was done in England in 1872. It's by an artist named James Tissot. Uh, Tissot was actually born in France. His name was Jacques Tissot, uh, but he moved to England and became one of the great English painters. This is superb uh, realism. It's a kind of realism that's associated uh, with society, with upper class society. But it is done in the most wonderful detail. Um, the light is carefully observed. The details are ca carefully observed. This is very much the type of thing that Tissot entered in the salon and would often win prizes. I like Tissot's work, so I'm going to show you another. Uh, this is the gallery of the HMS Calcutta. Again, this is upper class. Uh, this is rich people uh, relaxing. They're wearing fine clothes. Uh, they're in a very exclusive setting. Uh, the gallery of a um, warship, a British warship. And they're just enjoying the view of the harbor. Uh, realism began to uh, spread throughout Europe. Uh, this is an Italian painting by Telemaco Signorini. Uh, Signorini was the leading figure of the Macchiaioli, a group of young Italian artists that rebelled against the academy and decided they were going to paint everyday street scenes, everyday scenes of people. And in, in this case, um, Signorini went into a madhouse and painted what he saw. Another wonderful Italian realist, Antonio Mancini. This is done in pastel, and it is a highly detailed, carefully observed, beautifully lit a painting of a young man who's an acrobat. 
and it's done in pastel and there is again there's no message here it's just a scene that the artist found beautiful and interesting and decided to record it. In Russia there were several realist painters uh, perhaps the best known is Ilya Rapine. This is uh, an interior scene of people having dinner and then uh, somebody walks in that's completely unexpected. Uh, the kids are kind of interested in the picture but the adults are like shocked like they didn't expect to see this guy. The other great Russian realist is Isaac Leviton. Uh, gorgeous, beautiful paintings, very soft lighting. Uh, these are tonal paintings and they're not done with a lot of color. They're done with mostly the earth tones, the browns, uh, the golds, the dark greens, but there's a lot of tones of those colors and it creates what you see, a very poetic, a very soft, a very gentle painting. Uh, Levitan rarely is seen outside of Russia. He died young, he didn't even reach 40. And uh, I didn't know anything about Levitan until about 10 years ago when I was talking to a couple of artists and they said, yeah, look him up. So I Googled him and I was stunned. So I invite you, if you don't know Levitan, Google him. You'll see what a really wonderful realist painter can do. And then in Spain, the, the great realist, who's also an impressionist, is Joaquin Sorolla, who loved to paint on the coast uh, in Valencia, and he focused on the daily life of the fishing people. Uh, he would do fishing boats, uh, he would do people at a fish market, and in this case, there are people repairing a sail. This is a large painting, and it's got gorgeous detail and lots and lots of beautiful color. In Sweden, the best realist there, um, a man named Anders Zorn, um, really was a keen observer and loved to paint ordinary everyday scenes, um, mostly in oil. This is a watercolor. And uh, look at the light, look at the movement he's able to get uh, in the way he paints. Now I want to go into realism in America. Uh, American art is rooted in realism. Uh, it got started with the American colonies uh, sometime in the 1600s. Um, there was no king once we declared independence in 1776. Uh, there was separation of church and state. Uh, in Europe, the king was a frequent customer for portraits. And as you saw, for over 800 years, the church was the only customer uh, for murals and and for scenes of people and, and had to be biblical scenes. But that wasn't the case in America. And the early settlers that came to America were fleeing the wars of religion. Um, with the Reformation came a counter movement. So there were these wars between the Protestants and the Catholics. And a lot of Protestant sects decided that they needed to leave. <clears throat> they didn't want to be involved. They didn't want to be destroyed. So. Uh, many of them, like the pilgrims, uh, came to America and set up their own colonies. So they came with them, um, they brought with them their English tradition and certainly the Dutch tradition of realism. If you uh, remember, the original name of New York is New Amsterdam. So the Dutch had a very strong presence in early colonial America. Uh, this is one of those wonderful early American paintings done in 1837 absolutely gorgeous realism. It's a group of people in a store or tavern or butcher shop and uh, the owner is holding a raffle to see who takes home the goose. It is ordinary life, it is done with precise attention to detail and uh, there is no um, inf influence about anything. They're not trying to get you to be a patriot or to be more religious or anything else. It's just direct realism. This is by George Caleb Bingham, uh, the great painter of the Missouri and Mississippi River folk. Uh, this is called Family Life on the Frontier, painted in 1845. And you see it's an interior. Uh, there's a family, there's grandma, there's uh, perhaps a couple of aunts, and there's no electricity, there's no television, there's no computer. Uh, they're just passing the evening before they go to sleep. Uh, Winslow Homer, one of the great American painters, 
Uh, certainly a great realist. This painting called The Country School in 1871. A beautiful detail, excellent proportions, excellent depth, and uh, just portraits of each of these little children and the teacher uh, in school in, in a remote village. Another great movement in American realism was uh, the Hudson River School. And uh, a good part of those painters were what we call luminous because they focused on beautiful and very detailed rendered light effects. This is by Francis Silva, one of those luminists, and it's a view up the Hudson River done in 1873. Thomas Eakins, another great American realist. Uh, this is the clinic of Dr. Samuel Gross. Uh, it's also called the Gross Clinic. And uh, when I was teaching art history, a lot of students would say, oh, that's gross. Anyway, this is not a theater where people pay and get to see something. This is an operating theater in a medical school. And those are all art students up in the seats. And they're watching Dr. Gross as he dissects a cadaver and explains uh, what he's doing as part of the medical training. William Harnett was one of the great realists, uh, still life painters. It's a style called trompe l'oeil, a uh, French term, which means to fool the eye. So you're fooled into thinking you're looking at actual objects. So it's carefully detailed, uh, very realistically drawn, and there's a light effect that, that works uh, so convincingly that you think it's the material's actually there. John Singer Sargent was the great uh, realist, impressionist painters of the upper classes in New York. Uh, he would do portraits of very rich people, and he is known for his portraits of beautiful women from these rich families. This is a, a beautiful painting. It's in the Boston Museum. It's the daughters of Edward Darley Bois, or Boyt, I don't know how he pronounced it. And he's, it's these four daughters uh, in casual poses in an interior, a very rich interior. Uh, there's some Japanese vases that I hope that young lady doesn't topple over. And there's also a, a beautiful uh, Eastern rug that the young child is sitting on. While a lot of artists were doing the upscale people of New York, Another group of New York artists that came to be known as the Ashcan School, they're Robert Henry, John Sloan, and uh, others, uh, they decided to paint everyday life of the poor people. So they would go into the poor sections of New York and they would paint everyday life, what they saw, people doing ordinary things. Here's another Ashcan painting by George Bellows. Um, this is the fight between uh, Dempsey and Firpo. Um, Dempsey was the champion. Uh, Firpo was an Argentine uh, challenger and they had a fight and uh, Dempsey won. But what you see in the picture is, is Dempsey falling out of the ring. Uh, he got back in and uh, eventually beat uh, Luis Firpo. Edward Hopper, a, a great realist from the 1920s and 30s, often uh, doing ordinary people in, in buildings, in their homes. Uh, there's a kind of a loneliness, a kind of a sadness to some of his paintings. Uh, this is one of those, it's called Night Windows, done in 1928, where uh, it's just ordinary life in New York and sometimes there isn't much to enjoy. This is by John Koch. It's called The Accident and it is, uh, in essence, a uh, self-portrait of himself. He was painting his model, a nude model, and they hear a crash and they go to see what's happening in a window. So, um, wonderful realist, uh, John Koch. Another great realist painter, American realist, is Andrew Wyeth. Uh, this is a dry brush watercolor of a cemetery. Uh, again, the subject is not exactly the cheerful, happy, a uh, rich people subject. It is ordinary life in a small town. This is a charming watercolor by the late great Steve Hanks, and it shows him and his one of his daughters uh, painting in a studio. It's a watercolor. Uh, it's done with careful observation of form and light and line. 
I'm going to show you a group of contemporary realist paintings. Uh, many of these are by artists that will be teaching you in realism life. And it is a type of painting uh, that these folks have adapted as their own style. And there's different styles of realism, as, as you will see. Um, this is by Juliette Aristides, and uh, she shows herself in the mirror uh, in the bathroom. And it's a, a bathroom sink with very soft lighting. And again, um, all the perspective lines lead uh, to the mirror where she shows herself. This is by Christopher Blossom, who's excellent painter of ships and things nautical. In this case, he captures a tugboat that's bringing a schooner into the dock. Uh, lots of beautiful light, lots of beautiful shapes, a very realistic um, painting of an ordinary activity. Uh, Carl Bretzky is a doctor who decided to also learn to paint, and he's done a very good job of it. He lives in Minnesota. Uh, he loves to paint uh, late evening, uh, night scenes. Uh, the absence of light is, is particularly special with him. In this case, this is just a very last uh, glows of light. It is just a street. Uh, it rained recently, uh, but it is carefully observed and, and done in the most beautiful style. Uh, Todd Casey, a uh, wonderful realist painter. This is a still life. Uh, this is so good. You can touch the lemons. You can clink your fingers against a silver bowl. Beautiful technique. Uh, excellent light. This is a watercolor by Don Demers, an artist who loves to paint ships and boats. He usually works in oil. Uh, but this is called the Repair Barge. Uh, it's just an ordinary scene you might see at a marina or at some port. Uh, and it is done beautifully. Uh, lots of gorgeous light and gorgeous lines. This is by Rose Franson, who is an excellent portrait painter. Now, this is called Mrs. Zimmerman. Uh, it's a portrait of Mrs. Zimmerman wearing a beautiful jacket. And in the background, uh, you see her home. You see dappled light from the trees. And you see what is probably Mr. Zimmerman uh, just sitting and enjoying uh, the beautiful afternoon. This is a painting by Daniel Gerhardt, a great portrait painter. Um, Midsummer's Night is very beautiful texture and a beautiful rendition of the fabrics. This is by the great master David LaFell. Uh, it's called Flow Blue, Apricots and Dried Flowers. Flow Blue is the type of porcelain. It is a um, Chinese type of porcelain with blue on white, uh, but it is a still life uh, that's set with very controlled light and uh, everything is rendered as accurately as possible. This is by Joshua Larocque. It's called The Little Beggar, done in 2012. Uh, Larocque is a wonderful painter, very much in the style of the French academic painters, especially in the style of Bouguereau. And here's a painting of uh, Joshua's wife on the right, but this is a painting of, by Bouguereau on the left. It's Gabrielle Co, the daughter of Pierre-Auguste Co, one of uh, Bouguereau's best friends. And you can clearly see the influence uh, when uh, Joshua started his painting of this lovely woman, he had clearly the painting of Gabriel Co in mind. A painting by Tim Lawson. Um, gorgeous, simple painting, but full of beautiful detail and wonderful patterns of color and light. This is a watercolor by Dean Mitchell. Um, very much uh, influence uh, by Andrew Wyeth and really beautiful forms. And the exceptional thing to me about this painting is not, not because it is so beautifully rendered, but the light is so soft and, and there is no direct source of light. So you have to be very careful how you handle the rest of the painting. This is Grey Don Parrish, another great realist painter in this case. A portrait of Cory Burris as the American Sappho. Sappho is the ancient Greek poetess. Bill Schneider is an excellent portrait painter in either oil 
or pastel. I really like his pastels. I chose this one. It's called Introspection. And it is really appears to be simple, but it is not. And it's, it's wonderful control of the light and, and the, the way he positions the forms. This is by Mian Situ. It's called A Day in Laguna Beach. Uh, Mian is a Chinese trained artist that's best known for these large historical paintings of the American West. This is by Daniel Sprick. Superb control of brush and color, uh, able to create this very soft light. A pastel by a friend of mine, Sally Strand. Um, she was watching her mother washing the window and she decided, wow, this is a perfect painting. And that's how this painting came along. It's a pastel. This is by Mary White, who lives in Charleston, a superb watercolor painter. Um, beautiful pa painting called Paper Angel. And finally, in alphabetical order, Joseph Zabukvig, a European painter but works in the U.S. Watercolor, beautiful light, extremely soft tones that are leading you into a deep, deep, deep background. A gorgeous painting. So that's my lecture. Uh, welcome to Realism Life. I think you will see many of these artists in the programs that follow over the next few days. And follow those artists, learn what they're doing, and you'll be a great painter. Again, thank you very much for attending the lecture.